Hey gang, it is Adam again. Oh yeah, gotta get the reflection down off of the screen. There we go. Hey, so uh, this is the first lecture. Uh, so dealing with um, the Code of Hammurabi, Tale of the Eloquent Peasant, and I'll make a few gestures towards our readings uh, at the second half of the week. So since this is the beginning, uh, it begins with this question, where does political philosophy begin? And before there's political philosophy, there is political discourse. And I've given you a little description on this sheet of what I mean by discourse, but it's generally sort of the sum total of the way of talking about things. That's how we know about them. You know, I give the example of the discourse of cats, which is made up of scientific talk about cats, uh, talk among friends, diaries, all of those ways of talking about it come together to form it. And so before there can be any kind of philosophical questions about it, the topic itself needs to come into existence. And so uh, political discourse itself uh, begins all over the world. In every civilization uh, that we know about, um, eventually they began writing. And some of the very first subjects of writing uh, were political, uh, specifically lists of rulers and an account of where the ruler came from, or genealogies. Um, both where the ruler came from in the sense of previous rulers and their earthly battles and how did you historically come to be the ruler, uh, but also accounts of where the ruler came from that are religious in nature. Uh, and you see both of those actually uh, represented in the Code of Hammurabi, where, as we'll see in a second, uh, you have both uh, very concrete political accounts of where Hammurabi's power came, comes from, but also theological accounts. Uh, and a thing to keep in mind whenever you're reading ancient texts uh, is that it was quite expensive uh, and difficult to produce texts in the ancient world, to do writing, and it was restricted to a very few groups of people. And so it's always a very good question to ask yourself, why was this written? Why was the investment of time, energy, and materials put into recording these specific words in this way, uh, because it wasn't done lightly, especially in the ancient world, um, you know, as opposed to, well, why was this Twitter post posted when there's so little effort that needs to go into it? There might not be some grand strategy behind why you posted, you know, Cinnamon Toast Crunch looking awesome this morning. Um, but if it takes, uh, you know, weeks, and so even, even in the case of car, uh, records that we have carved into stone, like for instance the Code of Hammurabi, months if not years uh, that go into it. Um, so it's a major strategy. Why was this text uh, written? Um, in any case, we could start at any place in the world, um, but we'll be starting with a Middle Eastern text and an African text. Uh, the Middle Eastern one, of course, being the Code of Hammurabi, and the African text being the tale of the eloquent peasant, which comes to us from uh, Egypt's 12th dynasty. And I have a couple of cool pictures of each one of those for you. Also notice the difference between these two uh, materials, even just looking at them uh, for a second, looking at the images. The Code of Hammurabi is in stone, and it's in a monumental form. This very powerful image in the top, we have an image of a god handing a king, the, supposedly the this code of law. Um, Whereas the tale of the eloquent peasant we have recorded on a piece of papyrus, um, much less, uh, it's not a monument, it's not to, to display anything to all of the population. It's written in a way that also can be distributed more discreetly. So right off the bat, even just looking at them materially, we see some differences between these texts. But let's jump in. So the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, one of the key things to think about right off the bat is a bit of the context. So Hammurabi was in an interesting position, actually. Uh, uh, he was is the one who created the Babylonian Empire, which wove together a whole bunch of different uh, diverse populations all throughout Mesopotamia. Uh, Hammurabi himself was Amorite, uh, and he conquered a lot of Akkadian-speaking people um, all throughout Mesopotamia to forge together the Babylonian Empire. Um, and he found himself in an interesting position of being a ruler of a lot of different people who weren't necessarily uh, the same people as him. You know, they didn't, it wasn't, well, we got together and elected one of us to be king, or even I am the king of the same people 
uh, that I identify with, but I'm a king of all of these sorts of different people. Um, and so Hammurabi finds himself in an interesting position of having to explain why all of these people uh, should recognize him as king and should accept his rule. Um, so the first interesting uh, thing to note is the history of the Babylonian Empire. The second really interesting thing to note is the language uh, of the Code of Hammurabi itself. It's written in Akkadian, uh, which was, an, it's, in, it's an interesting choice. Uh, it was not the elite religious language. And generally, as I was mentioning before, um, political texts uh, were generally interwoven with religion, and then they were definitely written uh, in whatever the religious language was, in the same way that you might think of medieval Christianity used Latin as their religious language, and then the, the you know, French or German or English or the common languages of people uh, would be separate. There'd be a gap between this uh, language of power, if you want, and, and everyday language. And the Code of Hammurabi was written in everyday language, uh, is the thing to keep in mind here. Um, and that book should immediately uh, strike you as significant. Why? Well, right off the bat, uh, in the prologue, you'll notice Hammurabi making mention to the fact that anyone can come in front of this law and ask it a question and address themselves to it. It speaks to all the people in principle. Um, and the fact that it was written in a language that anyone could read, who could read, um, is significant in that sense. Um, and so that brings us, that already leads us into our next question of what was the role of this law code? What was its purpose? Um, and the, the two prior questions build into that. Um, one, holding together the Babylonian Empire. Two, uh, connecting all of these everyday people into some idea uh, of the state. Um, and so the law code was on the one hand, uh, a way of organizing society, but on the other hand, uh, it was also a justification of that society. So it organized society, it also served to justify it. Um, and that's in its clearest uh, demonstration uh, in the prologue and the epilogue. Uh, so notably, the code isn't just the code, it also uh, contains uh, a description of Hammurabi himself uh, in the prologue. And there's a lot of elements. The first thing that'll probably leap out at you is all of the discussion of the various gods and the way in which one god gave the authentication to another god who eventually gave Hammurabi the right to rule Babylon and gave him all of this wisdom. Uh, and it'll probably strike your attention right away. Well, Hammurabi is the king, at least on his own account, because he was chosen by God. But if you really dig in, and this is what I really want you to do when you're reading this, really dig in and look carefully. Um, I've bolded a couple of items for you. Uh, so as you read carefully, you might notice a lot of subtle reasons why Hammurabi thinks that uh, he is the legitimate ruler. Um, and in that sense, uh, the Code of Hammurabi is not just an early account of law, it's an early account of a justification on the part of the ruler of why they should rule. Um, and we're going to encounter a lot more of that. That's going to be one of the sort of themes of our course as we're looking along. Is one of the reasons why we talk about politics um, to justify rule so that it's not merely arbitrary. In other words, I'm stronger than you are, so let me tell you what to do. But uh, here are a bunch of reasons why you should consider following what I have to do. Uh, so I want you, as you're reading, um, particularly the prologue and the epilogue, to think of that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, one of the one of the questions I also want you to think about um, going forward uh, is going to be, uh, what is the function of the justification of rule? What happens? What are the consequences of justifying your rule? What happens once you publish this code of law? Because clearly it was published with a desire for a certain effect. Um, and the, one of the questions we want to think about is, uh, First of all, what effect was it designed to accomplish? And second of all, does it actually accomplish that goal? Or does it accomplish other things as well? Um, digging into the Code of Hammurabi, one of the things that I want you to think about uh, is right at the beginning in the section that I've called Justice Methods uh, in the text. Uh, one of the fascinating things about the Code of Hammurabi is it has a bunch of different religious traditions operating at the same time. Uh, uh, sorry, justice traditions operating at the same time, a lot of different ideas of justice. Um, 
coexisting in a way that uh, should strike you as a little strange. Um, over here with code 2, uh, you have this idea of if someone is accused, uh, we should dunk them in the river. And if they sink, uh, it turns out they were guilty. And if they float, it turns out that they were innocent. Uh, this should be familiar to you uh, uh, with the idea of trial by ordeal. Uh, this is the term that you want for this. It might be familiar to you from the Salem witch trials, from the medieval world. Uh, and a thing to think about here is, what can you do when it's not clear what happened in a circumstance, when it's he said versus she said? Uh, and uh, in, our, in the United States, we have the idea of guilty until proven innocent, the presumption of innocence, uh, and that guilt needs to be demonstrated. Uh, you see over here this idea that if we can't figure it out, we have to appeal to the gods in a certain sense. Uh, and that's what the idea of a trial by ordeal was designed to get at. Um, Code 5, on the other hand, uh, has the idea of um, a judicial review, so trial by judge. And in fact, there's the idea that the judge will be constrained by penalties for a bad judgment, and so as a way to give incentive to the judge to be impartial or fair. And in Code 9, uh, we have an even more fascinating thing. We have, first of all, the idea of uh, trial by jury. We have a, a set of witnesses uh, that are uh, compared. Um, and uh, not only do we have a judge, but we also have the people of that society involved in the justice procedure. So we have by ordeal, by judge, and by jury, at least three different sorts of um, justice uh, represented in the first few codes in Hammurabi's code. And there are some other ones in there too, if you keep looking. Uh, you'll notice uh, in the law codes, there are different ways of uh, figuring out the right and the wrong of different scenarios based on the scenario. Uh, so right away, we have an interesting way of thinking about justice as something that adapts to the scenario. Uh, but by far the most uh, famous parts are ahead. Um, before we get there, uh, we have the laws themselves and then the most famous, which is Lex Talionis. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, one of the things I'd like you to think about as you look through uh, the excerpt that you have are what sorts, what aspects of social life um, does the code address? What parts of social life are considered a good subject for the law and what falls out of it? That would be an interesting question for you to ask yourselves. What part of society, what part of social life isn't covered by the law? And to do that, you'd need to look at the, um, the full uh, account of the Code of Hammurabi. Um, which is I also up on Blackboard. Um, but yeah, why, why would the ruler want to regulate the aspects of society that he does? And furthermore, why would the people want that? Why would the people in the society want these parts of their world to be regulated and why? Um, those are some questions that you should think about while you look through the specific laws themselves. Um, however, uh, the most famous by far uh, aspect of the Code of Hammurabi is the so-called Lex Talionis, which is Latin for the Law of Retaliation, uh, most famously known to you guys probably as Eye for an Eye. Um, this is often seen as a kind of uh, barbaric law. You know, you have the famous quote by Gandhi of uh, an, eye, an eye for an eye would leave the whole world blind. Uh, you know, this idea that eye for an eye is ultimately a very brutal idea. You know, if, uh, if I, uh, you know, if someone pokes out my eye, justice is that their eye should be poked out in return. Um, uh, one of the things I want to challenge you to think about uh, while you're reading this section and reflecting on it uh, is, is it in fact barbaric? And if, if so or if not, um, what's the rationality of Lex Talionis? In other words, why would it have made sense to people um, and why would it compel them? Why would someone follow along with Lex Talionis? Um, uh, is it out of fear? Uh, or is it out of some uh, persuasion that there's something rational about it? Um, and between those two things is something I would like you to reflect on. Um, something perhaps to take into the discussion board would be thinking about uh, how would Lex Talionis actually play out in your own life? Does it play out? Are there aspects of our civilization right now that still 
operate very much on this ancient Babylonian model of justice uh, that we sometimes think that we're so far beyond. Um, so these are things that I would like you to consider. Um, definitely take a look over into the discussion board to see more questions about the Code of Hammurabi. Um, but those are sort of the main things that I want you to think about while you're reading this. What is the overall purpose of the code? Why would people be compelled by it? And particularly with this idea of lex talionis, why would that be? Why would that be so powerful? Why is that such a very powerful aspect of the code? <clears throat> okay, so that's Hammurabi's idea of justice. Uh, we shift in the next part over to um, another text. Uh, this is the tale of the eloquent peasant which comes to us uh, from the Middle Kingdom, uh, and it narrates an interesting moment in Egyptian history. It narrates the, uh, an event that happened in the time between the Old and Middle Kingdoms, the supposed intermediate period, um, which was a sort of more chaotic moment in Egyptian history when there were several different rulers, several different pharaohs in competition with one another. But it was written in a moment of stability, so it's almost as if uh, like a story written today about World War II, or a story written today about the Civil War is a better example, a moment of internal conflict. Um, why would someone today write a story about the Civil War? Why would someone in the Middle Kingdom write about this, uh, an event that happened in this more unstable period? Um, we don't know who wrote it, but we can infer some things. First of all, it was almost certainly not written by a peasant. Uh, which opens up a question of why would someone want to write a story about a peasant? Why would it be written? What's the purpose of it? It's much less obvious uh, than Hammurabi's law code. Um, what's the purpose? Uh, so let's keep that in the back of our mind when we go while we go forward a little bit. Um, the Egyptian pharaonic system is similar to Babylon, a religiously anointed system. So the um, the ruler is justified according to a series of religious concepts. Um, and we have a lot of laws from Egypt that are like Hammurabi's code, but this text is particularly interesting, very unique, um, very unique really to world literature, um, because it not only addresses that same sort of religious justification, the sort of justification of rule that we encounter in the Code of Hammurabi, but it subjects it to an interesting kind of questioning that we will take a look at. So first, just to get clear, um, what happens in this story? Uh, I gave you a little quick outline here. You have a sort of hierarchy <coughs> of four different roles. And actually, if you count the wife uh, who appears at the beginning of the story uh, and is a concern, then uh, you should have five. So you have the wife at the bottom, Kunanup, her husband, who's the peasant, the main protagonist. Above that, you have Nemtanakt. Uh, who's a local wealthy man, a subordinate official, to Renzi, who is the high steward, or sort of the local governor. And then above Renzi is uh, King ne Neb Kauri, the Justified. And so right away from the very beginning, uh, you see a clue that one of the, one of the big themes of this uh, tale is going to be what is justice, what is the quality of justice. Um, and so, right, the story is pretty straightforward. Nemtanak trips, uh, tricks Kunanup and steals his stuff. Kununup comes in front of Renzi saying, hey, you know, this dude broke the law, um, I demand restitution. Uh, and he, in asking for it, gives a big praise of the idea of justice and of what the ruler is supposed to do. And Renzi is so impressed with Kununup's speech that he goes and tells the king about it. And the king loves the speech so much that he says, look, look, uh, Eventually, we're probably going to give the peasant what he deserves, but let's keep him in suspense and see if he'll keep making more and more speeches. Uh, and in fact, that's what Kununup does. He gives another seven petitions. Uh, and what's interesting is the petitions get increasingly critical, as you'll note, and they get increasingly desperate and increasingly um, not merely affirming what the king should be doing, um, but talking about how the king has failed which is sort of a very risky prospect if you're waiting for your property to be restored to you, becoming increasingly critical of the king. And finally, the king happily is impressed with Kununup, and he tells Renzi to give uh, Kununup a bunch of Nemtanak's property in exchange for uh, what Nemtanak had stolen. But the real heart uh, of this tale uh, is the concept of ma'at. Now, ma'at... Uh, was originally a term for an Egyptian goddess, and so it's a, originally a very religious concept. 
uh, and it combines in itself ideas of truth uh, and the good, particularly, but also a, a connotation of beautiful. Um, and it doesn't just apply to individual conduct, but also to social structure. Um, ma'at is often translated as justice, uh, but you can see how that starts to get a little strange in sentences like when, for instance, the peasant is say, saying, the king should both speak ma'at and do ma'at, speak justice, do justice, but also speak truth, do truth, and also speak good, do good. All of those ideas are interconnected uh, in the idea of ma'at. Um, one of the things that I want you to look at while you're reading this piece uh, is how, over the course of the tale, we learn a lot about what ma'at is. Um, and you can usually pick out this uh, edition that I've given you notes where it happens a few times, but any time when he's talking about justice, truth, rightness, good, all of those are translations of the word ma'at. Um, and track how the peasant is actually showing ma'at to be this many-faceted thing. There's a lot of levels to it, not merely economic, but also environmental, uh, moral, the role, that it, how it applies to the family, how it applies to agriculture, how ma'at applies to uh, criminal behavior. Um, uh, one of the things that this text is amazing for is showing this sort of wide variety. And how ma'at, here's the, the most interesting aspect though, uh, in this tale, the concept of justice doesn't just justify the ruler, but it also subjects the ruler to critique. Uh, and this is one of the core concepts that, uh, one of the reasons why we're starting with this pair of texts. Because in the tale of the eloquent peasant, we find an idea of justice that's used as a critical tool, um, which should at least begin to pose the question to you, um, whether perhaps the idea of justice is in fact not merely a justification of rule, but in fact a tool for those ruled to protest uh, their treatment, and a tool for the oppressed, a way of fighting back, and not merely a justification of power. Um, because that very same concept of justice, or not the same but an analogous one, as the Code of Hammurabi uh, enshrines, is in this text uh, used in a critical fashion. Um, but this raises a further question. What's the purpose of having written this thing? And this is kind of a mystery. Um, what, uh, and really a question that we can't solve um, uh, linguistically or, histor or historically, because it's lost to us, at least as far as I know. Um, however, it's a question we can ask philosophically. Uh, what is the purpose of this text? Why would this text be written? What does it accomplish? Uh, at least one of the things that it accomplishes, uh, I would suggest to you, uh, is a philosophical purpose of inquiring and thinking about not merely what is justice or what is ma'at, um, but thinking about, first of all, what, a, what are the different definitions of ma'at and what do they say about each other, these different definitions? And two, What's the use of the idea of ma'at? How does it actually work? What does it do? What is its function? Uh, and these are particularly philosophical questions in a way that Hammurabi's text is not. Um, so take a look over into the discussion board to see some of the questions that I'd like you to think about more specifically and directly respond to about the tale of the eloquent peasant. And I will talk to you again on Friday uh, in response to what you have thought about in any case, good luck, welcome to the course, and uh, please remember to email me with any questions. I look forward to talking with you on Friday. Take care.